Where's your tie? I didn't wear one. You didn't wear your podcast no. tie? No, I did. I could go. Uh, put all a, of us I could are wearing go, ties. I could go put a tie on. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Noclip. I'm Chad Revenants. I'm JJ Artimez. And I'm Andy Kinnick. And today we're going to be talking about Persona 5, which was a game that was released in 2017 on the PS3 and the PS4. It was developed by Atlas, and I didn't look who published it, but I'm <laughs> guessing... <laughs> you information liar! I know, right? I thought that I had everything. Uh, I think it was self-published by Atlas, actually, so... That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so, Persona 5 is a, a JRPG, a role-playing game, and I had been going over my head basically for an entire month at this point how it was that I wanted to start this episode, and basically what the thing that I think most boils down my primary question about this game is, do people... Play Persona, and I'm just going to say Persona 5 because I don't really know how the other ones work, mm -hmm. probably similarly, for the the RPG part, the, the combat mechanics and things like that. Genuinely unclear to me. I attempted really hard to get into 3 on the PS2, mm -hmm. did not succeed. If we're too late in my life to do that, had too many responsibilities. <laughs> Turns out responsibilities, huge deterrent to getting into any kind of Persona game. You're correct. Yeah. Uh, but the mix... Here's my theory on the situation, okay? Mm -hmm. I think the Persona series is to video games what serialized television is to film. And we attempted to jam all of that <laughs> into three weeks. So Yes, we did. I mean, I prepped. It didn't help me. I was, in fact, worse off than most of you in the end. Because it didn't account enough for finals and other things. But Yeah, I would think that, and I'll, I can't speak for the other games either. Mm -hmm. I've just played this one. That it appeals to a lot of, like both halves of the game appeal to a lot of people equally like i'm sure there are their own like splintering groups that strongly prefer one or the other right but i think if you're already into jrpgs you're kind of likely to also be into like slice of life dating sim stuff cuz it goes along with like anime right and all the, well there's a lot of slice of life <laughs> animes jj it's true yeah okay I look. I'm not, I'm not denying that. you. I'm not. I'm. I snicker for many reasons, Andy. So I think there's a lot of overlap in people who would like those things, and Persona gives it to them. Right. So I, I fall pretty as far as the the splinter cells of people who enjoy Persona Five. Per, Persona. I I did like this game. I'm just gonna go ahead and throw that out there mm -hmm. against all odds and like my <laughs> own. Uh, you know, personal preferences. Yeah. Uh, I ended up enjoying my time with it, but I am pretty strongly in the camp of, like, I could give a fuck every time that I'm in combat. But also, I played the game on easy. And I did that because I know that if I played it on normal, I would have stopped after, like, two of the palaces. Because it just isn't really... The difference between an easy RPG and a hard RPG is the amount of time that it takes to get the, the higher numbers you have to pump out in order to win a battle. And that doesn't really, like... I don't give a shit and don't have the patience for it. We know your stance on turn-based combat, Chad. Yeah, it's, it's pretty negative. But I have to say this is probably... Uh, like, as polished and varied as this type of system can get while still maintaining the, like, most baseline menu-based combat system. Yeah, I was thinking the exact same thing. Like, this might be as close to perfect as you can get with, like, a pure turn-based combat system. Mm -hmm. Like, pretty much every quality of life thing you could think of is in this game. What are you referring to? Like, I'm saying, if you, like, take away, like, the timed button presses of, like, uh, Mario RPG and, like, the time refill bar from, like, Final Fantasy, you're going, boiling it down to just turn-based combat. Like, 
which this game is. Right. It's got the fast forward button if you just want to wail, wail on enemies. That's fucking incredible. How no one ever <laughs> thought of that before. Um, you don't have to like backtrack to previous palaces, so you're not like retreading old areas and running into low level enemies. And like, um, there's like mechanics like the baton pass and like all these things where you can like. If you know what you're doing, you can like just steamroll groups of enemies if yeah. you're prepared. Notably, as far as quality of life changes go, in addition to its like Pokemon style like type weaknesses, you it actually memorizes them for you so that and there's even like a quick access button that mm-hmm. jumps you to the thing. So yeah, it has a lot of it has a lot of things that aren't gimmicks on the turn based strategy or the turn based like uh, RPG combat formula. But are like they do aid in it. Mm-hmm. Um, it. Everything's just really smooth. Even like switching personas. Like you can imagine like a two generations ago like Final Fantasy menu based version of that. Right. That's like pause. Bring up that blue menu screen, <laughs> and there's just a bunch of text listing them all. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you, know, you can. But it's just like in this, it's got like a flashy animation. It's like a nice stylized menu you can flip through them all really quick and see the pictures of them and all the skills and pop you know just use them and then go and attack the same turn you can switch personas as many times as you want right there's like no restrictions on it and it's it all works real well the smoothness i think really lends to the cinematic element that they're going for at kind of all times in and out of combat in persona 5 so it's not just like a consumer end quality of life thing like it, it actively makes the game look better at a moment to moment basis because once you get the hang of the systems your average combat encounter is going to be really really short and have like a small narrative arc to it where like especially if it's an enemy you've never seen before where like you see some crazy weird beast that you don't understand there's like a testing phase where you try and figure out what its various weak points and weaknesses are and then you enter into like the all-out attack knockdown mode after you're able to exploit those weaknesses and you get this like silly cinematic red and black th- throat slashing thing. Yeah, like the everyone jump, like does the, mm-hmm. the Looney Tunes dust ball yeah. it's, <laughs> attack. It's like the uh, team up attacks from The World Ends With You. Yes, mm. yeah, but Lo- Looney Tunes jokes aside, it, they it, despite using pretty much that exact trope it does look good and mm-hmm. it, especially right after you the, the looney tunes dust ball dissipates and you it, the finishing move is complete there's always that same little stylized photo because god damn does this game love it's like visual presentation mm-hmm. and anything that is still <laughs> if, if it's a static image in persona 5 it's probably one of the best like static images you have seen in like a console video game in some time very good yeah if it's a static image in Persona 5, it probably first had a nice animation that transitioned into it first. <laughs> right. Like, the Cause... when you go into the menu, like, you press triangle, you get, like, the scene of the protagonist, like... Putting his hand up. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, slapping the screen. It's, mm-hmm. it's just really cool. Yeah, and, like, every single menu transition has an animation tied to it. Right. It's a... Yeah, I, I would say that, that is also very good. And I think in the... Uh, Specifically, when we're talking about that, like the drawn style of this, uh, I think works so well for those types of things. Whereas, like, it leans pretty hard on the fact that most of the things that you're going to be like spending a lot of time looking at are going to be in that style because the 3D models have like a there's a give and take. Yeah, like 3D models have have are like well designed from like a pulled back perspective but if you had like during rendered cutscenes, like ones that are in engine uh things look weird sometimes Mm -hmm. mona is the big one for me i think that mona's character design is totally fine and good and which version uh, like uh metaverse morgana looks good generally but then when they show him in full 3D, it looks, like, really bad. Like, really, really bad. Because he's got, like, a big round head, and it, it looks like he came out of, like, a capsule machine. I don't know. <laughs> okay, here's how I describe it. The way, and this is an engine clue that they've used for a while in the Atlas building. Uh, the way the models look, even in this their most modern 
game iterations is like do you remember in kingdom hearts how they would have the fancy ass models for like important cut scenes with like full facial animations mm -hmm. and the models that were just like painted on static faces that they yeah, would shift just between textures yeah 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 it's like the midpoint between those two models constantly it, it's you can clearly tell that it's painted on but there's a mm -hmm. lot of like various articulation and things that make it stand out but you can kind of see that this is like a skin being put over something mm -hmm. in a way that's a little bit like eh, for modern standards, like the, the things, the things this is visually competing against uh, often, it, it makes you wonder how much they gave up for that shell shaded aesthetic, but they gained so much for the things that weren't the character models that I'm not willing to fault them that hard for it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd compare it more to like the wind waker where it's like, you can tell that Link's face is all textures, but they just like cycle between yeah, them. And they, yeah. They're just animated. But, um, I actually really like the look of it, and I think we had this exact same discussion on the Catherine episode. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's just a personal preference thing. But like, like yeah, I Atlas think it looks engine. good. Yeah, mm -hmm. personally, I'd like to give it a little more credit than you guys. <laughs> like, it's not perfect, but I, I like the look yeah. of it. I have a theory that this game is pretty close to what every 65-year-old grandma thinks video games are in, like, every way. All right. Has demons. Yes, Full definitely. of, like, occult horribleness. Yeah, you can... By the end of the game, you can craft Satan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can craft Satan, bring him under your thrall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you are performing robberies and various other criminal activities. Yeah, definitely a bad influence. Uh-huh. Full of foreign animation you don't understand. <laughs> it is totally alien to you, culturally. Uh, kind of sexually weird in a way that will, like, pervert the children, uh, presumably, from a grandma's perspective. Yeah, I've been perverted. Yeah. <laughs> Recover from that one for a second. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I think... And most importantly designed to replace your life completely <laughs> uh, like 100 percent a life substitute that you will stay up until the wee hours of the morning playing yeah, because just, it's more important than your responsibilities you can just imagine the like no mom <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> i'm playing persona <laughs> yes yes all right uh you made a better case for that than i expected <laughs> uh i feel like it, that's totally true on paper. Mm -hmm. I actually feel like an old person might think this was cool if they saw it in action, though. <laughs> like, if there was a game, like, my grandma would like... I, it might, I, it be, might be this one. What? At least the slice of life parts. Okay. If, I could see, like, imagine, all, like, um, <laughs> Elders React or whatever. Yeah. We're going to bring it up again. Yeah. Um, if they had them play this, I think a much higher percentage of them would like it than most games. I, I like the idea that it has, like, basically the emergency buttons. Like, uh-oh, my uh, my parents are coming into the room. So you quickly leave the palace, and then it's like, objective, go to school, do your homework. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, like, all, like, the demons and things are contextualized in such a way that you kind of don't even think of them as demons oh. until they're specifically, like, Satan. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> because that's the thing that, like, old religious zealots are really a keen to I context <laughs> sure. i mean if they think that pokemon is satanic then satan is probably satanic <laughs> yeah but I was that was that really old to people that didn't like pokemon it was just... more like religious fundamentalists yeah. You're, yeah you're gonna have to worry the percentage of old people that are religious <laughs> fundamentalists the venn diagram there's a lot of overlap <laughs> you you strengthen your primary poke party by nothing but like horrible murder acts you like you yeah, you hang I mean, people like and decapitate them and, uh, cool looking, it, you know? it is <laughs> yeah. i am mainly at this point just curious how cool your grandmother is well okay that might have been an overstatement i'm just <laughs> saying like if an older person was gonna like a video game like i would probably put this one forth before a lot of others Maybe because it's average. colorful and stylish and fun. Okay. And lighthearted. I'd put it above Skyrim and the whole like Skyrim <laughs> yes. sphere of video games. I'll agree with you there. But clearly, you, if, if you're looking for the intro, you're going to pick Brain Age. That's the only thing you pick. Oh, yeah. Brain Age. <laughs> okay, that's Because they like, I've already scored very high because I'm in my 60s. Right. <laughs> Wait. My brain is 60 years old. Oh, yeah. oh, that's what that... Mm. Okay. I'm sorry that your joke took so long. Your brain age is very low. <laughs> <laughs> I have the lowest brain age of the podcast. Uh, I feel like, okay, so 
I promise I'm not going to, like, I just want to, like, spin off of some of the things that you said, like, okay. going forward. Um, and for, and I, I just wanted to mention this because, like, it it confused me so very much. Uh, am I wrong in that Persona 4 was heralded as, like, being a really progressive game and, like, a lot of people liked it because it had, like, it was, like, sexually open in a way? I have genuinely no idea, and I'm I, very sorry. I feel like I heard about this, like, on, like, Idol Weekend or something, like, years ago. Okay. And then in this game, <laughs> Ryuji is, like, uh, abducted and molested by two, like, very oh, yeah. fiery gay gentlemen. <laughs> and I don't understand, <laughs> because it's such an abrupt shift in tone, and it's very strange. Yeah, this game has a habit of just abruptly shifting away from the tone if it's various, like sexual ethical messages yeah. i noticed probably the, the easily the the left turn that kind of described in many ways my experience with persona 5 as a whole was right after the very first palace whose like whole core message was about like respecting yourself and like getting away from like sexually predatory situations right and i'm like being and not even like in an anti-sex way like in a sexually empowering way and then like literally like less than a week after that occurrence, is like an out of left field extended let's go rent a prostitute sequence <laughs> between the three primary male characters of the yeah. game. Right. Yeah. Because, at the time. because I am an American, mm -hmm. that whole like thing with your teacher, Kawakami, yeah. like being a maid, I was like, is this like a joke? Is she actually a maid? But the joke is that like it seems like she's a prostitute, or is she just a prostitute, or is she just a maid? Like, I, I literally could not ever tell until there you get to a part in her quest line mm -hmm. where the people blackmailing her call her a sex worker. So I'm like, she was a prostitute the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> That oh. you see the cultural sensitivity <laughs> that you need here, Andy, is the understanding that that deep ambiguity is really the whole point of the profession. Mm. Uh -huh. it's, it's really the entire goal is to create that ambiguity right. so that you can't feel cheated well, if they just like clean really your good clothes. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> is, does this explain why I can never find prostitutes just like in the yellow pages? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, yeah. Unfortunately, America really got rid of all that thing. You can find them in the ads, though. That's true, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the ads in the yellow pages. We've got to be a very dark place in this day and age. <laughs> I've not checked recently. But uh, back to, I guess, what we were trying to talk about. No, uh, no, no. Yeah, I think this is actually uh, this oh, is I was gonna, way into exactly yeah, what I'm saying. I was just yeah. going to mention that, like, this game is completely stereotypical anime with its sexual content. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like, yeah. there's maybe not as much of it as you might think if you're unfamiliar and listening to this, <laughs> but there's still, like, it's still, like, characters do not have nosebleeds. Right, see, yeah. You know, but it's it's basically exactly yeah. what you would expect. It's not even as, like, inherently suggestive as something like Dang and Ronpo was. No. Right. Which is, like, it, it, it has, like, a... Uh, uh, I don't know, it's like ensorcelled with the idea of like teens just <laughs> doing things. Whereas like Persona has like an has has way more restraint than something like that. And also it even has it has like a weirdness about you becoming like like actually sexually entangled with anyone who is like of your own age, but is totally okay with sexual entanglement with people who are much older than you. <laughs> yeah, I think, like, my read on that was that the people that you're romancing in that case are more mature, mm -hmm. and therefore it's, like, easier to, like, get into a relationship with them. But yeah, it's, it's it's this is all like tangled up in cultural stuff that we have no yeah sure uh, experience with. Well, I one thing I think that provides context to this that I actually generally really appreciate about these games is one of the reasons I first tried to get into the series uh, so many years ago now mm -hmm. uh, is in comparison to most anime series. The Persona games try really hard to ground themselves on some level. Mm -hmm. Like, there is a day mode where you're supposed to just be a person, right. which is not a thing in a lot of other comparable settings or games that are like this. So, 
I think the reason why some of that like sexualized content is toned down in comparison to something like Danganronpa is because it's not trying to be as over the top all the time. It's trying to be selectively over the top. Right. Uh, and you guys know how much I love disparity in mm-hmm. those kind of tone situations. Yeah, uh, it's much to the game's benefit too. Like it really gives you an anchor for the more like fantastical persona metaverse stuff right and it lets you really immerse yourself when you're given free time because rather than seeming like it's really outside of the scope of what the game is normally about it feels like it's very much part of what the game is so i don't this is i know that you did the same thing and i'm guessing that you also did the same thing just because i can only imagine so, like the way that this game is designed, I feel like certain people are going to play it certain ways, and I think all of us fall into the camp that we did the whole palace, then just did a whole bunch of walking around. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. I think that they designed the game specifically with the thought that people would jump in and out, like go back in, go back out, like go raise a confidant level, get a new ability, then go back into the thing, but... I feel like a lot of people who play the game are just going to go in, do the entire palace in a couple of days, and then spend the rest of their free time walking around. Yeah, like, the way they introduced that made it seem like it was going to be a way bigger deal. Same. Like, the way, like, it was like, oh, you have a limited time to complete the dungeon. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I feel like it's going to be really long. This seems like that kind of game. I'm right. going to be, like, stressing to get to the end. And so, like, I ended up going through the first palace in, like, two goes, or a third one, because you had to come back for the boss. Right. And then it's just, like, you have, like, 20 days after that <laughs> to spend. Yeah. But that felt really good. I'm like, yeah, I got it done so fast. Right. Yeah. And then so I just did it that way every time. It feels rewarding, and it has, at least what I perceive as a benefit, despite this game being visually uh, very much about the thievery and the metaverse, it keeps those parts interesting, especially considering the repetition mechanically you have to go through with turn-based combat, but making them actually kind of rare as a percentage of total playtime. Like, your times... The time you spend in the game is mostly not doing crazy, exciting stuff, which builds tension for the crazy, exciting stuff. Right. And I really appreciate that. Like, it's... I, it, and that's something, as far as I'm aware, holds true with most of the series in general. Uh, and I know as for a fact that a lot of past games in the series... Uh, and the reason why that structure carries over and why it seems that like the game assumes you're going in and out mm-hmm. is because in the older games, there was less narrative content in uh, the metaverse. And you, assuming it was still called that in the other games, there's always a, 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 a secret other world you go into. Right. The Phantom Thieves stuff is right. new to this game. Yeah. yeah. I think in Persona 4, you went into a TV or something. Yeah. like Yeah, some kind of madness. But, yeah. but my point is, yeah. is that there was way less narrative content in the metaverse. Mm-hmm. In Persona 3... It was like literally a dungeon, like in like the D&D sense of a dungeon. Yeah. So you would go in and you would navigate hallways in brick and stone structures and try and like find your way through a maze to get to where you're trying to go. And they were way more big and way more complicated, but way less interesting to be in, which is part of why I bounced off of it. Right. Um, but that's kind of the legacy the series is working with. And it was this game that tried and succeeded, I think, wildly uh, to grant a little bit more gravitas to the actual metaverse stuff on a narrative level, and mm-hmm. I think it worked. Yeah, and each one's completely different, too, because uh, it's always tied to an individual and the story, mm-hmm. and so each dungeon has different enemies, different art assets, like a different theme and style to it, and, like, different puzzles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, within it so like that helps a lot as well i have to imagine that having the job of being like a creative guy on atlas's persona team when this game was in development had to have been like the craziest job in the world for the seven years it took them to make this game (laughs) like they're just like all right who are we doing today it's like well she's a shut-in and she's really into hacking and computers, but her palace is going to be a pyramid. Go. <laughs> and you're like, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to do at all. Yeah, but if, I all right, let's take that. a trip to Egypt and study the pyramids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
sounds so good, right? Because you go into the pyramid and you're like, you're in this crazy, like, hyper real pyramid with, like, mm-hmm. crazy Matrix hacker text mm-hmm. on the giant ball that rolls down to, like, slaughter yeah. and kill you. It's cool because, like, the hieroglyphs kind of kind of look like Matrix. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a nice touch. And they aren't even all necessarily cool. Some of them are just interesting or weird or just funny. Like, I, I loved the bank people. Like, the ATM people that were just oh, walking yeah. around. Because they all had their stories and they didn't matter. You mm-hmm. didn't have to pay attention to them at all and probably didn't. But they are all, like, in expressive poses. Like, needlessly expressive yeah. about what they're doing and how they're feeling at that time. And they're just the most depressing, horrible way. So I really <laughs> felt for the bank people. They were good. <laughs> Now, yeah, I had to imagine that working on this game was like a designer's wet dream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because like the the art direction and like the design of basically everything in it is incredible. Yeah, <laughs> like it's maybe like of any game I've ever played, like blown me away with its art more than like anything else. Agreed. Like. Obviously, it, it's a fool's errand to try and try and say something like, if you're neutral to style, then X. But, <laughs> yeah. like, if there was any way in my mind to make that kind of comparison, this game executes on a style goal better than maybe any game I've ever played. I, mm-hmm. I don't... It's not my favorite style in the world. It's a very good one, but it's just not my favorite. But it's incredibly good at executing at that. Mm-hmm. It's like um, that video you sent us on Roger Rabbit. Like, they definitely bump the lamp. <laughs> yeah, they bump the lamp. Because it, it, it's just like everything in the game is like, in terms of the art assets, is just top, top notch. Yeah. 110%. <laughs> and it really is just like, because people talk about games uh, having, like, being stylish. Like, that's like the goal they're going for is something that is like, it stands out like when you look at it like nothing in persona is even like during the segments where it's supposed to just be everyday life everything is accented in a way that makes it seem like it's like reading a comic like it's it everything is designed in that sort of uh way with like the scenery and all of the Mm -hmm. the the town designs so yeah (laughs) (laughs) Until I've got on art. Well, if you want to spin off of that, uh, because the one thing that I think that this game, like, tonally does, I don't want to say wrong, does weird, is that every, it, it takes every thematic element that you could possibly come up with and just puts it in the game. Like, <laughs> <laughs> there's so many themes throughout the thing. Your palaces are the seven deadly sins. There's The tarot cards are, like, integrated deeply into the way that like the persona system and the confidant system works you have like every individual palace has their own theme that has some relation to the thing and i feel like the game almost fucking gets away with it because it's a hundred hours long Mm -hmm. (laughs) and so it just can have that much going on and you have to just sort of like make it work like the classes, because your character is a uh, a student at Shujin Trivia Academy, where they teach you useless garbage, <laughs> and then they and then have you guess at answers to things you have no way of knowing. <laughs> um, Chad, you can just cheat. You well, can... yeah, of course, and I did cheat occasionally, but then I regretted it because I hit max knowledge at like seventy hours or something, and then I was wasting points in the classroom uh we'll get into this part of it later because this is a whole big conversation but uh like each of the questions is somehow factored into either the thing you're about to do the thing you are doing something you're gonna have to do in the future or one of the primary like three themes of the game being like either the the tarot and like fate and fortune Okay, then I have a test for you right now, Chad Rutherman. All right. Please describe to me what theme or activity <laughs> in the game relates to snow crabs not actually technically being crabs. Well, <laughs> hmm. Because <laughs> that one really stayed with me. I was like, that's... They do, because it's also a test question. So you mm-hmm. see it at least twice. It is. And I know that I was there when Andy got that question, so I've seen it three times for mm-hmm. sure. Uh, what about you can fish in the game? Maybe you can catch a, a snow crab. Mm. Maybe. Or a snow crab 
acts as a crab, look looks like a crab, but is actually part of a different species. Like Morgana is a cat who thinks it's a human. Double life. And that, exactly. Yeah. And the was, double I, life that's of what Snow I was Crab. Say, yeah. <laughs> Things aren't what they appear. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. We, we didn't say that they were deeply tied. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying. How did they pick these questions? Like, wait, who was the guy that was like, "Oh, this is a thing I definitely want to share with the world." And like, put it in the game. Can we get some art assets, please? Can one of you guys please draw like a text, like sketch of just a snow crab so we can put it in our game? Like, mm. Yeah, it's a little wild for sure. Yeah, everything's a little bit wild, but mostly in a good way. Yeah, there is. Uh, you know, you know what. I don't know if I want to spoil that, actually. Because there's also a playing card theme in the game, which is strange. Mm -hmm. uh, in the way that, like, because your character's name is Joker, they give you questions about the how, like, the Joker is like a trump card and how it relates to Shogi. And, of course, you meet a Shogi player who teaches you battle strategy, <laughs> uh, a.k.a. why I became a millionaire in Persona 5. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Throughout the game, and so there's even, like, ties into these, like, other little minor things that they throw in. Like, everything in the game is a seed that becomes something else or is part of a thread. And it's really, I don't know. It's cool, but then it's also very hard to keep track of. Yeah. Especially if you, like, take time in between play sessions and you don't play it all the way through. Right. In a in, couple weeks. Like in how one we did. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> This game is a Rubik's Cube, especially mechanically, in the weirdest way. What do you mean? You okay. have to solve it algorithmically? Is that Almost! What you mean? <laughs> it, 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 this game, this RPG, is an RPG with right answers. Like... If I don't know, because obviously I I cheated so much, I cheated all over the place, all the cheating that I did going through this game, I, because I felt like I was going through a spreadsheet once I realized how much a lot of the different decisions that I went through it with, and I knew I'd only get one shot at this, so like I knew of like I wanted to see how far this game is willing to go with your weird teacher relationship. Oh, I need right, I needed yeah. to optimize toward making sure I saw the maximal point of this game, but. It, this game, you know, has questions where the way that you answer them gives you more points than others, and those compound over time, and every decision that you make compounds over time. And the game is it's very much like one of the sharpest relief of the Eastern Western RPG design style I've seen in a long, long time. Because you aren't you're ostensibly kind of mapping who you are, but you kind of want to optimize everything, and if you do things well, you can optimize everything. Yeah. To the extent where, like I, I, I looked this up before because I was just curious if this was possible, and it was. Like the like optimal playthrough guides of this game are like Excel spreadsheets that say what you do on every single fucking day. Like there's yeah. because it's all about time management. There's absolutely like no room for individual variability if you're trying to optimize. Right. Uh, it's all about being the best version of this one guy of of Joker. Who, yeah. by the way, the guy of many faces. Yeah. S slight tangent. I find it hilarious how much this game uh, correctly assumes its audience with Joker. Like, not, why include a character creator whatsoever? You're going to be like a high school aged boy who's like kind of nerdy and socially distant with glasses who doesn't care about his hair. Done. Right. The entire audience of this game. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like... Uh... I don't know. I actually feel like the demographic for Persona 5 is probably a lot older than Joker is. Uh, really? Like, like, re like, I think that this is a more, like, adult-focused game. I feel like the... Uh, I could not disagree harder. Really? Really. Yeah. I, would, I would also agree with Chad. Yeah, I don't At think... At least that, in the West, anyway. Yeah, like, I don't think kids are playing Persona 5. I feel like it has too many uh, intricate systems to appeal to, like, ve like kids who are very young. Now, obviously... People are going to like what they like, and uh, there are obviously going to be kids who are like 13, 14, who are fucking way better at Persona than I am, <laughs> and there are going to be people who are older who prefer, like, there are people in their 30s and shit who play Minecraft, and like, oh, maybe it's dominated by, like, a younger audience, and they're going to change. 
it takes all kinds. However, I think that the majority of people who are going to engage with Persona, at least on a level where they're going to feel like they want to actually roleplay Joker or try and optimize to like get as much out of the confidant system as they can are going to be people who are like in their 20s like i think that is like more the target demographic for this game yeah and i think that this game and like we're talking about like the widest like general audience it would have over here i think this game is going to appeal to people like our age that like we're like might have played this on the play like persona on the playstation when it came out like i think this is like a 20 year old series now and i think more people our age are going to know about it and therefore play it because of that well i can see that it's just it always runs up with a time commitment for me that and a lot of memories when i was younger of persona people which were very rare but were demonstrably (laughs) a thing uh, some of which I'm sure existed at your high school too, dear listener. Uh, but like, I, it was always an undercurrent that I was close enough to to be aware of. And while this release I know has gotten more attention over an older demographic, likely, likely for the reasons you guys are mentioning here, people familiar with the series and kind of tuned in with the press enough to know like, oh man, this is not a niche thing. This is just really good and it's getting a lot of attention for it. I feel like the older titles especially were a far more niche offering just because there wasn't a lot of positive press around the older versions of the game and that optimized themselves more towards, not to be insulting, but like basement, like in my room, go away mom. <laughs> the otaku kids. <laughs> yes, kind of. Basement dwelling man children. Yeah, but not in like... <laughs> No, not in that way. <laughs> Basement drawing children, children. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just regular children who yeah. happen to have a PlayStation in the basement. Oh, here, here much better. Basement dwelling children who think they are men is what is okay. what this is for. Okay. Yeah. Uh, see, because the first game in the series that I had even heard of was mm-hmm. Persona Four, and like through that, like have like, it's funny because like I was like in the middle of this game, I was looking at like different things going on and was like what if like this is the fifth game in a series i was like how much of this overlaps and it's not the fifth game in the series because like in my head i had this inkling of like there is a thing called shin megami tensei Mm -hmm. that i don't know if it's the same thing (laughs) or like a related thing Mm -hmm. so at one point i literally google searched what the fuck is shin megami tensei (laughs) (laughs) and your answer uh uh, inconclusive. <laughs> <laughs> it seems as though people don't even are not even sure. But there's so much in this franchise, and I heard about it seven years ago with Persona Four, mm-hmm. which is like the it, it is even has a name that says like this is unassuming and is not part of a four hundred thousand game <laughs> series. <laughs> They're making a dancing spinoff, if you're curious. I think already yeah. made, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, if it yeah. gives you more insight into the demographic here. Yeah. <laughs> this, this might just be a personal experience thing, but like, I just don't know how many like teenagers now are like into anime. This one hundred. But I mean, I'm sure it's like ton, it's, I'm sure it's like just as many as when we were teenagers. But like, <laughs> I feel like our generation was like the pokemon dragon ball z generation and i feel like a larger percentage of people our age are probably into anime than kids now agreed more familiarity i have i have some expertise on this topic okay as a web forum moderator i have to (laughs) constantly interact with some approximation of the modern team Mm -hmm. as as i classify them uh and there are things I, i believe that are called like high school of the dead and there's some kind of, like, superhero high school thing that's uh, very famous right now. Yeah, yeah. High School of the Dead is just straight up the name of an anime. Right. I think My Hero Academia. That's what, correct. Yeah. Spot on. There's also a witch one that's, uh, like, My Witch something. There's no, a witch thing. I've, I've, I think I know what you're talking about. I think all three of us together could potentially piece... <laughs> <it's> together <laughs> a, a map of modern anime, yeah. but that's about... Mm-hmm. So yes, it is. There is very much. It's still a thing, as usual. All thanks to Adult Swim for all things <laughs> good and gracious in, in the world. I say as I look to Andy, <laughs> spite in his eyes. But yeah, but that things 
things are going smooth, I think, on the anime front, as far as I'm aware. I assume things are getting worse slowly, because that's just how the world is right now. Things get worse over time, yeah. Mm-hmm. Slowly. Just right now, slowly. But Any other things that, like, tragically reveal our age and distance from modern life that we want to <laughs> discuss, or... Uh, see, well, to my point, not really in Persona 5, because I feel like it, it pretty much tapped into... Uh, my like well of knowledge to present everything like with the exception of the things that were very strictly like japanese culture which really huge props to the localization team for keeping this game like as japanese as they did Mm -hmm. like they didn't change names they didn't change like you didn't go get fucking donuts (laughs) (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) you actually got like actual things the japanese people would eat and didn't make any claims that it was not that uh and you know all the city names and stuff are all real places uh I think all of that was was well done, but outside of that stuff, everything that was like referenced was something that I like had a point of contact with. Yeah, and like you can you even go buy like a tube TV, a DVD player, like a an NES, like you know, and like the parodies of like movies and things are all mm-hmm. older. Yeah, yeah pe- the Cake Night Rises, Cake Night, <laughs> Hacksaw, yeah. yeah. The the X folders. Yeah, the X <laughs> etc. Et Guy McVer. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, okay. What I wanna do is talk about why the walking around life part of the game yeah. is important and why this is something that like affected the way that I've played through the game. And then I wanna talk about how that affects the main gameplay mechanics and things like bosses and palaces and shit, and we should come back to it now that the generalities are out of the way after we take a break. Agreed. Agreed. My yeah. lips are very dry. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the driest my lips have ever been while recording this podcast. Uh, That's impressive. My lips are a little dry. Uh, no, we can't make the same joke <laughs> for two episodes in a row. <laughs> but, but it presented itself. <laughs> it did present itself both times. I'm cool with it. And also, I, I'm totally drawing out this, like, us talking around the microphones thing because of the song I plan to use in the middle. It has, like, that long buildup and, like, it, it affects, like, the way, like, having a play over people just having casual conversation sounds good. Talking about their disgusting lips. Their disgusting yeah. cracked <laughs> GRI lips. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, we were talking before we left, and then also just now, about some things that we wanted to talk about, and we forgot a lot of things that we should definitely talk about. Example, the music in this game is fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As is the tradition, <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, uh, I wrote the name down because it's a Japanese name, and I'm uh, an American and mm-hmm. don't remember Japanese names. Uh, the guy who, the composer for Persona 5, is a Shoji uh, Meguro, 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 Megatron, <laughs> who's also the composer for Catherine, and therefore might just be my favorite game composer working today. Oh, damn. Like, everything that he does is just, like, amazing. And this whole soundtrack is, like... 20 hours of amazing, just chilled out, great music. This is, I think, unless you, Chad, can find a quote of me saying this before that completely invalidates it, (laughs) the most weight I've ever seen a soundtrack carry successfully in a game, you repeat actions so much in Persona 5 on so many different levels. I mean, the game is about living a life. And life is kind of monotonous, Mm -hmm. even the exciting parts sometimes. And so you hear the same tracks over and over and over again. And at half the quality of this game soundtrack, the music would have still been good, but I would have still gotten annoyed with it. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I could have heard the battle soundtrack like thousands of times <laughs> like actually thousands and i still want to listen to it in my car yeah i can think of no greater compliment of a game soundtrack than that 
Yeah, I like that you hit on that because I completely agree. Like, I really, I don't think I like the soundtrack as much as Chad. I think, like, on its own, it's great, but it's really the sum of all the parts of the game that I think elevates everything. Because, like, yeah, like you said, the soundtrack just keeps everything from getting repetitive. Like, you do do the same things over and over and over and over, but it doesn't somehow doesn't feel like it because mm-hmm. like when all these uh, by their powers combined <laughs> all these things like just stay interesting and because the soundtrack is so notable like when you're actually listening to it like i couldn't help but like tap my feet along with every single song as it came on it also makes the silences really palpable because there's never a moment where they cut to to silence where you don't know that something serious is going on. And whether that's like a, in a confidant relationship where like you're hitting a turning point and the silence helps you recognize that and kind of key into the emotions you're supposed to be feeling. Or in the example of like when you're at a palace and you like encounter the ruler for the first time, it'll usually fade the music down and then... Because, like, every single time that this happens, somebody joins your party, it then comes back in with the great, like, uh, I forget the name of the track, but the, the like, becoming your other self song, mm-hmm. and, like, the energy just, like, spikes massively, and then they play the, like, guitar-heavy battle track in the net in the ensuing battle and so it gives you this like emotional touch point at every single moment of a hundred hour game and that is impressive and to your point i finished playing this game on monday we're recording this on thursday and on literally every day since then i've just been listening to the persona soundtrack because even though i listened to it for 99 hours and 35 minutes I still want to continue listening to it all the time because it's just that good. Yeah, I've been listening to it too. (laughs) I know three people who have never played this game but had just bought the soundtrack. (laughs) It's just not a thing that I've ever seen in a video game soundtrack happen before. Assuming it's not like licensed music or something. Right. Like I've never seen someone just go out and and just purchase the soundtrack and not the game. Right. (laughs) Especially considering, like, on the iTunes store, this the soundtrack costs the same amount that I paid for the game. <laughs> uh, wow, shit, really? Yeah, it's it's 30 bucks. Oh, wow. It's, like, 110 tracks, and it's, like, it's like many, many hours long. <laughs> oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Over, like, 7,000 hours of distinct It's, music. like, actually a good deal at <laughs> twice the price of a regular CD. Uh, anyway, though... Um, we can move on from that. I just had to bring it up mm-hmm. because it's been like basically the, the backing track to my brain and yeah. thoughts for the uh, past three weeks. Last surprise specifically is a lot like um, Jump Up Superstar was for me. I was uh, just yeah. like, why is the song so good? <laughs> <laughs> like uh, it's kind of cheesy but like the music is great oh yeah and like life will change is amazing uh get up get up or wake up get, get up, up get, get out, out there, there is so fucking good the the whoever the session bass player is at <laughs> atlas needs like a fucking award <laughs> because like really fucking like just really funky bass in every song <laughs> it's i don't know it's just uh, very enjoyable all the way through it really hits like a note that I, I don't get a lot of music from, and weirdly it always comes from video games. Like, certain songs on the Hotline Miami soundtrack, Catherine soundtrack, Persona soundtrack, all have sort of, like, this, can have this, like, chilled out vibe that I just want a lot of the time. Why don't we start talking about actual video games, Let's talk Chad. about people. Let's talk about personal relationships. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh... So, uh, as I mentioned before, with the, like, having the music help you key into, like, the emotional responses you're supposed to be having to certain elements in confidant relationships, I have this, like, tug of war going on in my mind about how I feel about the confidants overall. Mm -hmm. Because the thing that this game did that, that really, that nailed it for me, like, probably the most important aspect of this game for my enjoyment of it is the like min maxing and sort of following along with 
uh, all of your day-to-day activities in order to get, like, the most out of the game. The time management, the decision-making, everything's on a deadline, and that applies to your life as well. Like, <laughs> part of the enjoyment that I get, like, the, the sense of, of accomplishment that I get out of my own job has to do with meeting deadlines, like, just the innate satisfaction of doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, this podcast is, like, a self-imposed deadline that we all put on ourselves, <laughs> and Persona 5 is just deadlines. Like, do everything by a certain point, and then be, and then feel satisfied because you did it. I don't think that's the intent, and that's where the the pushback comes from, because I, they want you to be invested in these characters and like these characters. And while I do some of them, I feel like maybe I didn't care about a lot of them. <laughs> Here's my theory on this. Partially because of just the sheer size and length of this game, mm-hmm. and, the num- and thus the number of, like important narrative characters and party members that you eventually acquire within it. Every character's individual story to prevent there from being like a multiplication table of interactions is self-contained. And it's self-contained in a way that fell flat with me often while going through the confidant relationships. If those relationships ever tried to address like serious subject matters, uh, probably the, the best for me partially just because of how of it being a serious issue that didn't necessarily require you to be different places uh was the you the the doctor the death doctor and oh, you, yeah. you, mean, yeah. you mean single punk rock doctor yeah, oh, yeah punk single, rock doctor. single punk rock doctor Ta- i think it was like tie tie to kim yeah yeah to, yeah to kim, whatever it's and it's not one. just because she is just physically just the in absolute pandering <laughs> to everything that i find attractive in people mm-hmm. uh it it's Stories, because it made more sense in her case that she didn't really interact with everyone else that you knew of or mm-hmm. that didn't really matter. Uh, but in things like a, what Mishima or however you pronounce his name, yeah, Mishima, yeah, the the zero loser kid who does your fan website work, like that felt. There were tons of sections in that that felt very forced and like like the side quests that they were because they weren't really woven or integrated within the rest of the things that you were doing like you you engage a confidant relationship and you go like level seven or something on one night and you go out and he's evil all of a sudden and like you resolve him being evil in like five minutes and then yeah. you like leave him machine storyline is incredibly weird depending on the way that you tackle it i think that there's like a sweet spot where if you do it at a certain time it won't feel as strange but like he engages you so often in the main plot without having anything else to do uh with his actual confidant relationship it makes it so that him suddenly being like we're we're gonna go change this guy's heart then he'll have to be nice to me (laughs) uh is like a totally out of the blue moment because like one minute ago he was like hey good work uh that now bullying is less prevalent in the world like (laughs) he goes from being like a pbs special (laughs) to like the dark side club of 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 persona 5 and i don't understand why uh well i do understand why but i don't understand why there wasn't more of a limitation on it yeah i'm gonna say it's also weird because i don't really know how like the developers think of mishima because it seems like the game wants you to dunk on him all the time oh yeah he like <laughs> like there's always like two being an asshole responses <laughs> to mishima yeah <laughs> like and, they, i don't think they want you to like him <laughs> and most of them are like pretty like are positively received like he laughs off most of the yeah, time like you, you dunk picking on him, on him. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like, I think the game wants you to hate him. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's weird. It's super weird. Like, they just have designated Mishima as the wet blanket <laughs> of Persona 5. Yeah. But to circle back to what we were talking about initially... Um, sexy punk rock sex, doctor. Yeah, single punk rock <laughs> yeah. doctor uh, is obviously the correct romance choice. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> but uh, I, unlike Chad did not engage with the min-maxing element of things, because that's not me. Yeah. Right. But um, on the confidant relationship side, 
I, I think you hit on it when you said that because the game is so long and there's so much stuff in it, you kind of stop caring. Mm-hmm. Like, I cared about, like, the first handful of people. Like, <laughs> Ryuji on Yusuke, Makoto, etc. Like, the, that first chunk, like, in the first half of the game, I was mm-hmm. like, wanted to level them up to 10. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then it's like, it keeps going. Like, I didn't get the fortune teller till later, which I regretted. Uh, and for, uh, for min maxing fortune teller first person yeah. that you got to for some to. reason like the first time i went to the red light district like i was unable to interact with her and then forgot she existed yeah which was not good for me <laughs> but then you got like the kid in the arcade yeah. and uh, the girl in the church and like towards like the latter half of the game when i'd go hang out with them i'd fast forward through the conversations like i was like i don't give a fuck (laughs) like i've been playing this game for 80 hours (laughs) like i don't care anymore (laughs) which is likely where the extra like five hours that i spent on this game came from you know the entire game of time that i spent on this game (laughs) uh, over where you were is probably just because of like the amount of time that i was just like reading pointless conversations i thought literally like five times i was sitting down to finish the game and was wrong yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's it's like 999 all over again yeah like oh man like i just was like i gotta finish this for the podcast (laughs) but like even if i didn't have that deadline i i still think like my interest in that stuff would have dropped off pretty severely towards like the latter half of the game it it, there ceases to be a anywhere near comparable stakes for a lot of the relationships compared to what you're doing outside of the relationships. Like I, I, for example, I think the frame narrative they go for in this game actually does a great job of reminding you of the stakes and even allowing you to have a slow build up in like power, so to speak, and influence while still keeping in context, something like truly big is happening here. It's a good context, but like, when you know that everything that's going on is a frame narrative of, like, you being arrested for, like, this crazy bank heist and all this bonkers metaverse stuff is happening, like, I don't give a shit if there's, like, one other model that, like, is kind of mean toward on. Like, I, I don't I don't care about this, like, incredibly minor social problem that only exists within the confines of this confidant relationship. Right. Which is odd, because I, I going into this, I expected to really, really love the confidant relationships because they're so similar to the support system in Fire Emblem mm-hmm. games. Um, but I, and this is probably just me being a pretentious, horrible person. I think the writing's just slightly worse or at, marketed toward an audience that it less, I'm less receptive to okay. than the Fire Emblem games I, are. I think, well, yeah, the writing in Fire Emblem is just better. Like, right. that's yeah. just true. Uh, not that the, the writing in this game is still good. Yeah, it's fine. Um, but, um, yeah, it feel in this game everything feels more car- compartmentalized. Like I think there's more of like a sense of like you have a tight knit like band of mercenaries <laughs> in Fire Emblem, whereas in this it's like okay, let's break off from everything and go to this backdrop and talk to An. If right. she's going to be modeling, oh. you know, it's like, it feels very disconnected. Yeah. You know what it is? And this literally just now occurred to me. It's because it sticks so hard to your point of view that everything is centered on you all the time. Mm-hmm. You never, ever like spend a significant amount of time with like Makoto and on like doing their own thing off screen. Right. You are the nexus to all things in Persona 5. Well, not only that, but the game also plays... Because I feel like you're right about the writing, and I think the biggest issue is that like each confidant relationship from level 1 to 10 is structured like it's a little miniature Persona 5, because <laughs> every one of them is like, you meet the character, and then there's a crisis, and then you solve the crisis, usually by going to Mementos, and then you finish it, and they love you, and then you get a special ability, and then that's the end of it. And you do that, you know, in my case, like, 11 times. <laughs> like, <laughs> I had, like... Uh, two-thirds of the cast at rank 10 and you start to see the patterns at that point yeah. like yeah like i to, i'm not trying to like uh shit on the games too too much because i did end up caring about a number of the characters but like it almost feels less like getting to know your friends and more like collecting your friends <laughs> right yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> like you, you want to you want to level up their confidant to level up their confidant and not to become better friends you. with them it, yeah. yes spot on like i 
Do you have any idea how much I would ignore Mishima if he did, wasn't the XP <laughs> confidant? Like, yeah, oh my yeah. god. And, and like to a certain extent, actually, that might be to the slight detriment of the game. Like, I'm okay with there with being mechanical impacts to your friendships. Mm-hmm. I just think a lot of them are strong to the extent that makes makes them kind of take over the narrative importance, which might be them trying to compensate for the writing and the localization, who knows. But, like, I spent so much money on that prostitute lady <laughs> <laughs> for, no, for no reason. For no sexual benefit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, yeah. not at all. <laughs> Literally just for the for the free time and the hand around the house yeah. because it was so good to have free time. And I kept having to, like, justify to anyone who would watch me play this game, of which there were several, like, why the prostitute was such a recurring thing. <laughs> Well, I mean, to be fair, like, the hot for teacher thing's a pretty common fantasy. That is true, it yeah. Is, yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's not commonly expressed openly, repeatedly, no. for dozens of hours. Among, <laughs> yeah, but. Well, and also, I think her quest line's one of the most intriguing, too. It is. I'm not just making excuses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, and not only that, but uh, she also provides one of the best, like, time spent to abilities gained yeah. benefit in the entire game because that you'll just like not have to do things in class which raises your social stats and you can mm-hmm. fucking have her wash your dirty laundry <laughs> so you can so all right i'm just gonna mention this right now because there's no other place for it there's a, an item that you get in one of the last areas uh it's just like that T- uh, palace's version of the dirty laundry item and it's called classified gear and its description just says declassify at the laundry <laughs> which is my favorite line ever in a video game but yeah you can have her declassify uh your dirty laundry at the laundromat or make sp regenerating items which are the best items in the whole game yes and uh so like progressing with her it's good that they put as much effort as they did into her confidant like storyline because you just should do it <laughs> like it's mm-hmm. it's very it's important yeah. like but so many of the confidants give really good abilities and one of the ones that i was surprised about how good it was was the politician uh getting him to rank 10 it makes every battle like halfway trivial because every time that i would get into an encounter by the end of the game because like i had if you combine, let's say, Futaba uh, Shinjo, the arcade kid, yeah, and uh, and Yoshida together, which I had by the end of the game, you can just show up at a uh, at a battle, immediately be put into a holdup, and then just instantly get the persona. Like no attacks thrown, no <laughs> weaknesses found. You just walk up and you're like, "Hey, bud," and he's like. We've, I am that. I am that. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know there is it. Yeah, like it's completely insane like how Just smoking a cigarette. <laughs> he just I was like, "Hey, I've been waiting for you. I'm Thor, god of thunder." <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, like the common of villains you just like just crazy good. Yeah. yeah. I think they dropped the ball with the politician. Because I didn't even notice him and would not know he was a thing if Chad didn't get him. Right. And well, in the way that you get in, him, you have, to, you have to get a part-time job at a beef bowl shop. Yeah, <laughs> That's not a thing that you would think to do. He's in that, like, central square. Mm-hmm. And, like, after hour, like, two, you have no reason to ever go there, ever. Yeah, pretty much. I don't... Well, li- there is that one time you have to go there to talk... To a homeless guy. But he's down below. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but you have to know that, and there are multiple homeless I, guys, I, I and there's guess. one there. Yeah. Okay. So there's a chance. <laughs> yeah, you there's a chance. Back. I actually think that's a failure of map design here, because I know, and I believe that because there are other areas of the game that I think do the map design really, really well. Mm-hmm. In the overworld, I'm, I'm meaning. Mm-hmm. Uh, because this game obviously has you make use of fast travel so liberally constantly that one way to make it still feel like you're in like a living world and you're walking around while still having that much freedom in mobility is the way that they design it so that you fast travel not like into buildings often but like just outside of buildings in big hubs like shibuya like when Mm -hmm. you're when there's a million shops all over the road Mm -hmm. like 
I feel like they kind of screwed that up a little bit with the subway system for the sake of, I don't, I don't know, realism or something, or to have that big reveal when you go up to the central street for the first time. But I think all of the like ancillary areas that are around the subway, you hit like three or four loading screens going through all like mm -hmm. the mall and the underside should have all, if possible, been like one kind of truncated, shrunken down individual subway area yeah. with a whole lot of different offshoots. Yeah. Dude, the design of the subway station, I think is just bad. Oh, it's, it's like, I'm, I'm, usually like pretty good at navigation in games like something yeah. i pride myself on i could not find my way around there like <laughs> at all in uh like i i was like of two minds of it for an hour because i was like this is good because the first time you get there you're not supposed to know where you are and it kind of makes you immerse yourself in the character it does initially and then 30 minutes later i was like Fuck this whole game. <laughs> Fuck it. And yeah, I, I was like, I was like, genuinely like dreading it early on. I was like, I'm gonna have to like learn this whole place. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, no fast travel. Just everywhere. All, everywhere, all the time. Yep. Yeah. God forbid you don't get a text message from Yusuke and you want to go like have him duplicate a card or hang out with him because you're like. <sighs> All right, <laughs> I go to the platform, and then I just spend like an hour running in a circle. I'm like, I've seen this shot before. Where am I? <laughs> Dude, guy's at the underground walkway. He's at the underground walkway, but if you teleport there from anywhere but like your house, you just show up like way off on the now, side. If you go to Central Street and take the station from there, you walk down the stairs and you're right in front of him. Do you see how what Andy's saying is like navigating in the real world? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the bad. I don't want that. <laughs> Dude, yeah, yeah. If you, if you warp there, you're like nowhere close to him. Yeah. Like, you go to Central Street, access the subway from there. He's right, right there. Do you okay. think it's just the real underground subway layout? It's it, just confusing. Yeah, because it has the like weird, seemingly unplanned, sprawling nexus of spiraling cities and gates that I would expect from like a real world well, location. Yeah, it's not the. Uh, the subway itself, it's the underground mall that's there as well. Right. Like, that's what really throws a wrench into it. Yeah. Because you're like, what even, what, like, early in the game, you don't even know where you want to go. You're like, is this one the one that has the thing? Mm -hmm. Or is this one where Anne hangs out? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But, like, I've been in a subway before, and, like, I'm uh, a moderately agoraphobic, and so, like, being in a subway platform just immediately throws me into a state of, like, absolute panic. <laughs> Moderately, moderately, moderate, yeah. absolute panic, and so yeah, I guess this kind of mimics that, but like in a far more frustrating way. Yeah, because it doesn't like affect you in the same way. Yeah. Don't really think. Although I, I agree with you on the initial effect that it had, not worth the next ninety-five consecutive hours yes. of of minor costs. So anything, any other really specific thing we want to harp on for like eight continuous minutes? Yeah, how come the first time in the game that you have to find someone, literally everybody's wearing the same clothes? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my one really specific thing that bothers me. Please do tell, Chad. It's just like when you're getting info on, on uh, Kamashita, you go to... Uh, school, and when you're at school, they're like, go find a member of the volleyball team. And then you look around and everyone is wearing the same tracksuit, and you're like, well. <laughs> it's a uniform, Chad. Come on. They gotta it, be realistic. It is a uniform, but everybody looks even more distinct when they're wearing their, but now, boys, girls, doesn't matter. Everybody's in a red tracksuit. And you're like, well, shit. Like, where am I supposed to go? Okay, my tiny little nitpick is the everything in the art totally flawless all around this was such an eyesore to me that i had to take a picture of it the fact that her hat gets clipped off by the bounding box <laughs> <laughs> oh, i thought you were going to complain about her horrible forehead no but nope yeah you mean her five head like know. why would they not adjust the size of the hat to fit inside the box <laughs> i don't know i don't know that just stood out to me as a design person. It did. That looks oh, like yeah. shit. It doesn't look great. The shadow goes all the way to the edge of the screen, too. Yeah, yeah it doesn't look right. Yeah, I'm sorry, Haru. Uh, um, we're going to throw this in the uh, but, uh, description that, just so that... That was my nitpicky thing. Yeah. Okay. So do we want to go then from the nitpicky thing and the confidant relationships to the way that that affects and the actual mechanics of battling in this game? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would love that, Chad. I would love to battle about the game. Mechanics, yes. 
Because <laughs> all right, so we mentioned this earlier, and then immediately just like took a hard turn. Yes, we did. And, all right, we're done with the voice. <laughs> okay. The old ladies from Fire Emblem podcast. Yes. The Fire Emblem Coven. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, so. What we mentioned before was, this is a very polished version of the RPG turn-based system. Mm -hmm. The way that the confidant abilities interact with the combat, I think, is like it's one gimmick that I think makes it actually pretty interesting. Uh, I I really like the, the fact that some of the abilities that you get actually directly affect the way that things work. Notably, Gun Kid has a lot of just very interesting abilities. Because you get, like, the bullet hail when you jump in. Uh, it just, like, do some damage off the, the bat. And, like, kind of gets you, like, a little bit amped up, like, subconsciously. Because, like, the first thing you do when you start the battle is just mash the X button. It happens just infrequently enough that it's always exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah! Woo! <laughs> get fucked. Yeah. Get smoked. <laughs> Eat lead. <laughs> Uh, I also just like the inclusion of guns in this game. Like, I think that it's it. It's weird that they're like an an elemental weakness. Like, they're like a magic type in yeah. this game. Yes, but uh, they're all very cool. Like, I like the the sound design on them is really good. I like the fact that you can like choose to meet out how much how many bullet resources you want to spend mm-hmm. on a turn. Uh, and like how much damage they do generally, the fact that they have a whole upgrade tree and everything else, like the just like guns in general, I think are really well done in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, and again, I did not finish the entirety of this game, but in my 55 hours of experience, I felt like, and this is a weird thing to say about a, a JRPG of all things, I feel like the numbers kind of didn't matter enough. Uh, yeah, like, I felt like the actual combat system of this game really didn't care much about the stat lines of, like, your immediate personas, the damage that you deal with your weapons, and especially the damage you deal with your guns. Yeah. And it's mostly just about exploiting the elemental type weaknesses so that you can have holdups. Mm-hmm. And that's, like, the actual, like, type match, rock, paper, scissors-y thing that's going on under the hood. And that's, like, uh, and, and it lends itself this, like, way overinflated importance to abilities that can like that have high critical ratios yeah because there are a lot of there are too many enemies in this game that don't have an elemental weakness and so you end up with a situation where you're like well either this battle is going to take a very long time or i have to like land a good miracle punch or like have another you know like one of ryuji's attacks or waste half my clip yeah, just like hoping to get a. <laughs> yeah. Well, there and there's some percent. Like you can plan for every conceivable situation, but having a plan for every conceivable situation is incredibly taxing. Because like I would net like I told Andy, uh, I never spent less than twenty minutes at a time in the velvet room. Like oh, I would go oh, in yeah. and just be like. All right, like, let's pull out a notebook and be like, let's see, this guy here, I want this. I don't have a curse ability. I'm going to need to pick somebody up with that. Yep. Do I have that ability that lets guns crit more often? Because that could be really helpful here. (laughs) I don't know yet. So, like, put that on the back burner. This is a thing to look for. (laughs) Like, I got the cork board and the thread running between all the personas I needed. Yeah, and I'm so the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. I'd go in and go to Fuse by Result and just make, like, this... Three or two or three strongest things, and then leave. Right. And, I, and that worked for you. you, you oh didn't... yeah. Okay. Good yeah. to know. To be fair, I did watch you play through the end of the game. Uh-huh. You would have benefited from having oh, yeah. a bigger my, like my menagerie, big... yeah. but you got through. Yeah. My biggest thing at the end of the game that was a problem is I just like didn't have enough SP restoring items. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I should have stocked up on those more. Oh, being not done with the game yet. Yeah. Do you have you purchased four SP adhesive threes yet? <laughs> I don't know what that even means. Oh, yet. you oh, need to. No. You gotta It'll do that. Your life. Your whole... What are what are SP adhesive threes? <laughs> okay. So, single punk rock doctor. Yes. Sell. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry. I'm, I'm gonna at, need single I'm punk rock doctor. Rapt attention. <laughs> the moment you mention single punk rock doctor, as am I. Uh, she'll she'll sell an item. that's an accessory. Uh, like it's uh, 
The yeah, items. Accessories. Called, yeah, yeah, accessories. Yeah. yeah. That's what they're called. Uh, that's called an SP adhesive, and it's got a variation one, two, and three. We, each one gets better. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they just regen SP like at a certain amount at the beginning of every turn. Holy fuck. <laughs> yeah. What? It's yeah. the best item in the game. <laughs> so we need to discuss uh, the reason that this comes up is not just because we're trying to be your prima strategy guide for Persona <laughs> 5. The SP system is like the difficulty sca- curve of the game. Yes, like, absolutely. That is I how it this. creates. It's, yeah, it's comparable not to bring up that game, but it's comparable to the Estus Flask. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I one hundred percent done that this. Game. In fact, I, one thing I was going to bring up later was that I felt like that it was a mistake to add an item in the accessory slot that increased your max SP at all. Right. Because it made because SP is the resource that allows you to extend not just your effectiveness in battle, but the amount of battles you can have, functionally giving you more time if you have more SP. And this entire game of it's about time management. Yeah. So like a resistance to anything, no matter how good it is or any of the other accessory slots, absolutely pales in comparison to buying time with that slot. Right. Which is why a lot of the accessories in the late game that you get you ha- like all have to be compared to just having the SP regenerating or SP gaining ones and can be like super super good and you and still be like I don't know. Like <laughs> regenerating yeah. 7 SP per turn is almost better than having Queen's necklace which just gives a flat plus 3 to every stat. Wow. <laughs> and additional SP. Yeah, actually. like I even put an SP adhesive on Ryuji who like doesn't use, use it, yeah. SP at all. <laughs> uh, it's like yeah, it's just that good. Yeah. But yeah, so the SP system like especially in the first couple of, of, of palaces where you don't have access to items that just give it to you give it back to you mm-hmm. is uh, really what I thought this game was going to be like about and in the end it kind of is because it's your time limit on your palaces and like while playing on easy it's a lot easier to get through entire palaces in one night which also gives you more time to up your social stats and your confidant relationships and makes the game overall easier mm-hmm. uh just like the fact that like the first time that I went through a temple, I got to a point where I got to a safe room and was like, I'm going back because I'm out of ab- ability points mm-hmm. is like that was the point where the design like they ticked that box. Like somebody at Atlas saw the statistics of me leaving the palace midway through and went, we've done it, guys. Like <laughs> <laughs> this was a successfully designed palace. Yeah. See, for me, I always wanted to try and play chicken with the game, mm-hmm. where I always want to push on as far as I could without, even if I just had to use, like, regular uh, attacks to beat enemies with. Right. Damn. Yeah. Well, like, that, like... It, it, it really felt like like tagging a bonfire. And just being like, let's see if I can yeah, get let's see if to I the can next make one. To the next... I, I do, I agree with that. And I did sort of the same thing, but I'm even more sensitive to wasted time in real mm. life than I am to wasted time in the game. <laughs> so I would I would take the extra day of not being able to do things for the added benefit of mm. being able to use my personas. Mm. But they do also try and... Uh... Balance? Yes. We'll go with that. My hand motion was dumb. Yin yang. Uh, Yeah, the other half of this is that there are also Persona abilities that cost HP, which the items are more plentiful, but also your HP gets often restored using SP. Yes. So it is like a weird cycle where it's like your health items technically can save you SP, and your SP items can save you HP and SP also and the abilities you choose are like a so you have to do like persona calculus to figure out or no actually there's an ability in the game called sh- you have to do shadow calculus to figure <laughs> to figure out like if i use megaton right here that's going to cost 79 hp and i'm going to have to use like this ability on another character to regain the hp which is going to take this much hp <laughs> or you just fucking do it which is what you're gonna do it's so funny to me that you think of the game in that way (laughs) (laughs) i do too yeah like like, i'm so much more general with it (laughs) like i'm like 
this is gonna take like 79 hp and i have like idea of how much of the health bar that is like i think of it i do not think of it in numbers at all like this is why <laughs> part, part of the reason why i mentioned much earlier in the cast that this game is designed like a rubik's cube from my perspective mm. because although there's some random chance in like how moves sit and the success rate of status ailments mm -hmm. like all the most important things that you do in and outside uh, of the combat sections are all just like numerical trade-offs that you're trying to optimize mm -hmm. and there's so many of them constantly <laughs> <laughs> and not only that but like you have eight moves per persona mm -hmm. and like this is less of an issue when it comes to like uh your protagonist's personas um but like on each of the party member personas those eight slots are really important if you're thinking about the game in like a very numerical <laughs> mathematical way because you're like the biggest one for me is near the end of the game your like support characters Makoto and uh, and uh, Morgana mostly like on gets healing I or healing skills as well but um, get this ability that uh, it's like me media ramen. I'm not like the noodles, Ra whatever. I Meteorama. forget. Health Raymond. Yeah, Meteorama. That is like a. Well, no, because Meteorama is just the one that's. Um, whatever. Yeah, this one has like an N at the end because it's the strongest one. We don't care. Yeah, but it uh, like is a full heal for everyone or a full heal for a single person, but the SP cost is way higher than the one that's like a good heal, like a moderate heal. Mm -hmm. And. Having the moderate heal, because I know you had characters that still had the moderate heal, including your protagonist, yeah. at the end of the game, and I was, like, so envious of the choice that oh, you yeah. had. You always <laughs> want that in the back pocket. Yeah, because <laughs> I had the one that, that, like, gave everybody full health, and, like... Because it's like it's like twice as expensive. Yeah, to it's use. Thir it's more than it's thirty uh, SP to use the full heal and twelve to use yeah. the mid heal. And if like everybody takes a little bit of damage, you're always gambling that they're just gonna get fucking demolished. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it was always weird to like have to balance that. And it's that's just one of those like really good choices when it came to making this game something that you can engage with. Oh yeah, that eight slot limit is fantastic, and you can tell because it's a pretty clear evolution of like final fantasy style spell systems because mm -hmm. in those games you wouldn't have the slot limit and you would just get every upgraded spell as you level right and you would just have the option to use the most optimized economically efficient thing for your mana meter every turn <laughs> <laughs> but in this game making you choose the efficiency options you have can, adds a whole another layer to it and one of the many reasons that I, like you, Chad, spent 20 minutes every time I was in the Velvet Room doing something or just panicking because I eventually had a combination of personas that I realized would have to force me to like, lose certain moves unless I was going to be totally attached. Uh, the, what, arguably the most devastating two words in the whole game are can stack. Because now I'm just like... Oh no! Like, <laughs> what do I want? But because these, you get an ability like, and you go through the like regular upgrade path of any of like the uh, party members' personas. You get an ability that's called like, like Makoto gets like nuclear boost, right? Mm -hmm. And that increases the uh, pa the power of the nuclear attacks by twenty five percent, just flat out. Then near the end of it, you get another ability. Because you get these, like, you know, like, Counter-Strike is a move that's better than Counter, and it says it can't stack because you don't want to have, like, a 25% chance. It's just 15. Yeah. But then you get Nuke Amp, which does stack, and you're like, do I sacrifice having two moves to do 75% more damage? Because that sounds really good, but I have no idea if, if it's good enough oh, yeah. to overwrite something else. So I was just, like, like seriously, like just, like, leaning back, <laughs> like, looking at the TV, like... This is where it ends. Like I can't, I can't fully optimize this the way I want to. Yeah, making you trade like variability and generalizability for power in such a unique way because that's a trade-off that's actually really common in games and but and so often falls so immediately into the specialization route that people don't even consider it a question but because of the combat not being optimized toward numbers and more being optimized toward exploiting weaknesses mm -hmm. it makes it incredibly incredibly important to be diverse among your entire party yeah so it makes the, it makes the choice between what in any other game would be like oh damage i'll pick damage immediately right into this like fucking mind-numbing mathematical <laughs> thing <laughs> yeah it's very very well done uh, in that respect and while 
I, this isn't intended to contradict what I said earlier, but I think I do wish the numbers mattered a little bit more in this game. Pretty much the only change that I would want to make to the system as structured here is I wish technical hits had the critical hit effect. Like when you do tricky stuff, like mind brainwash an enemy and then hit them with psychic moves. Right, set somebody on fire, hit them with a wind move, that kind of shit. Yeah, yeah, because it's already action inefficient compared to just hitting the weakness as is anyway. Right. And it would give you something to do to the ones that have no weaknesses. Mm -hmm. and, and well, it does, it just doesn't give you like the the trump card knockdown all out attack. Yeah, it doesn't give you the hold up, which is what it's really for. Right. Yeah. Um, but. In ever in the defense of this game, the combat system and Andy, <laughs> he did not think about the game in these in the same like way over analytical way that we did. Mm -hmm. Played the game on a higher difficulty and also finished it in less time than I did. So <laughs> <laughs> obviously, you can get by. Yeah, well, through no, persistence I, I, and smart use yeah, of ability. I really don't like crunching numbers like that at all. Right, and I always think to myself like. I, I played RPGs as, like, a kid. Like, this stuff really doesn't matter that much. Like, I can coast in certain ways, and it doesn't matter. Like, I never let that stuff, like, get to me. Yeah. For some reason, and this is, like, this is a 20-year-old memory at this point. Uh -huh. That's not true. It's, like, a 15-year-old memory. I played a game on the PS2 called Xeno Saga, which was, uh, was it Monolith Soft? Are they the people yeah. who make? Yeah. So they, they produced uh, an RPG that I think, like, broke me on RPGs, because if I'm not mistaken, or I was just, like, uh, 10, 11 years old and couldn't think about things without it taxing my brain. Uh, <laughs> but, like, it was so, like, stats-heavy that, like, I just feel that way about RPGs all the time now. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's probably where this, like, weird obsession comes from. But it really clicked with me in Persona, I think because I was playing it on easy and was able to just sort of, like... Like, I could fuck up and there was an allowance for it, mm -hmm. but it also, like, I got to have the part of it that I think is fun, which is, like, that making a mental spreadsheet thinking, mm -hmm. like, I don't know why that's fun for me, <laughs> but it is. Yeah, that's the opposite of fun for me, <laughs> yeah. so. It scratches a very similar itch in my mind to how I felt in high school when I was making competitive Pokemon teams. Mm -hmm. It's in that headspace. Yeah, yeah see, definitely. actually, like, planning out the team was my least favorite part of it, so... <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, why you guys love magic so much, and I don't. You want wow! This is the most true <laughs> mm -hmm. thing you've ever said. What's the mana curve? Of this yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I just don't engage with that kind of stuff. <laughs> also, I don't really like board games that much. But oh, anyway, I gotta, I gotta play the right board games with you. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, you were you were gesturing to me because I was going to move on. I think no, I wasn't. Ge oh, oh, I don't know what I was doing. Why were move we gesturing on. to each other? <laughs> Who knows? Okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we're getting there as far as time goes on this one. Um, but I want to talk about palaces as like a thing, like the this game's dungeons and just like the design. I specifically want to talk uh, about Shido's a bit. But we should probably build up to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, does anybody have any like thoughts, like notes they they made on the uh, houses? Uh, I really, really appreciate the effort to like put puzzles in, but <laughs> man, were they way too shallow? Yeah, that's just true. Even up to the very last. Dungeon. dungeon yeah every but, puzzle was just i mean kind of... to be fair like i would appreciate a shallow not well thought out puzzle than just combat in hallways so mm -hmm. i i liked that they were there i just wish there was a bit they were more uh more focus was put on that that's uh, so i already know andy's response to this which is uh, i'm an idiot so i would like <laughs> uh jj's response on this because i had such an unreasonably difficult time moving in this game. Like, doorways were a challenge. What? Like, I couldn't, like, the very early things like just moving around the environment were difficult for me because I felt like the character's movement was, like, super influid and, like, impossible to, like, gauge where I was headed. But I got over that because it's just, like, I don't know, just, like, less sensitive than I want it to be. But the thing that really killed me later in the game, literally in the case of the game's, like, combat, was the fact that, like, the fluidity of hiding 
j- ambushing people and just like moving along things or popping out of cover felt like I could never press buttons at the right time for some reason. Oh, no, Chad. You're definitely just a stupid person who okay. doesn't understand <laughs> video games and controls. If anything, I felt like this game was too fluid, like fluid to an extent that annoyed me. I felt like Overland Movement kind of felt like you were a hockey puck whose trajectory you could only like kind of influence when going in a straight line. This is kind of exactly what I'm describing. I found this a big issue for me. Oh, I didn't find it a big issue at all because oftentimes a disproportionate amount of my movement would be like toggled jumps between hiding spots anyway. So it didn't even really feel like in in the times when movement mattered to me, I wasn't moving with the stick. I was just jumping between spots. I almost never did that. I feel like I think part of what you're getting at, and this is like a total guess, um, but it almost kind of feels like his movements, like Joker's movements are kind of snappy. Mm -hmm. Like almost kind of like, I don't want to call it digital because that means something else when you're talking about controls, (laughs) but like almost like he's like locked to like a hexagonal instead of like free... Yeah, it's like you're Circular using a movement. D-pad even though you physically can't use the D-pad for movement. But like, but I don't know if that's what it is cuz like it didn't bother me at all. But there there is something about the way he moves that's the, maybe not what you would expect. Yeah, cuz that's what it is because the one that like consistently embarrassed me was my inability to walk through the subway gates because mm-hmm. like you have to line it up. I, like imagine if I was just more diligent with my camera controls and put it directly behind my back, I wouldn't have as much of an issue with it. But I felt like the angle always made him like run into the side of a door frame or run into the thing and then just kind of have to like do the video game slide <laughs> yeah. like, to the door while you're still walking. You force the hockey puck like a little bit against the side and then push it into the goal. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, but it, like, which didn't make a huge difference in palaces because like in palaces, enemies are like Metal Gear Solid 1 enemies. Like yeah. you can just like do a jig behind them for an hour and they'll never <laughs> notice you. Yeah. Uh, but like the, the issue came like when you had to... Uh, hide behind things to avoid enemies and there was like the opportunity to ambush somebody versus the opportunity to hide somewhere i felt like i would hit the button to ambush or hit the button to hide and it would like take just long enough that the other option would be the one that he goes for Mm -hmm. and i don't know Literally never happened to me once. Uh, you obviously had a lot more practice with it because you started doing it way earlier. That I happened didn't do it until to like me. the sixth palace. Was like, <laughs> oh, wow, really? I mean, I did hide, but I didn't like move by hiding okay. until the, the sixth yeah. palace. Um, God, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, that it happened to me like super rarely where I would accidentally ambush a dude or accidentally attack them instead of ambushing. Right. Very rarely. And I fall kind of in the middle where I found it kind of hard to sneak around at first, but I did it more and more as the game went on. This is why um, uh, you said his name like not even that long ago. The the gluttony guy. Tony Hawk. No, that was more than a moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to remember because it sounds like Shido. It's um, Kanashiro. Kan- Kanashiro. Yeah, Kanashiro. Yep. Ka- yeah, Kanashiro's palace is like the exact like the hottest and coldest palace in such like in so many ways because the palace is really long uh for like an early game palace the first half is like a nightmare of like tight hallways where you can't do really anything other than just attack all the enemies because they force you through it most of the time and is just kind of shitty like the first half is oh go collect a key card go on the elevator uh boring but then you get to the second half which is super monotonous looks way more boring but has like probably the best puzzle in the whole game which is that like oh it maxes out at that oh i'm sad now. <laughs> yeah it's oh. not great well, the opening the vault the, yeah the, the you logic have to, puzzle with the 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 logic it's like math r- yeah real yeah. easy math <laughs> and that part i kind of liked and then the boss fight was cool but i like the visual of the vault yeah, like the overview. Yeah, like it's fucking huge. Yeah. It was very neat, but I don't know. It's not a huge fan Yeah, no, of that, that was my least favorite palace. You liked Piggytron? Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> of course Chad liked Piggytron. Of course he did. <laughs> also, uh, what, uh, 
Kaneshiro. Kaneshiro himself looks like Baxter from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like, he's a purple fly man. And I cannot believe, no, like, I've never seen anyone be like, hey, why did they just put that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles character from 1987 into Persona 5? <laughs> like, without changing him at all. <laughs> but, uh... I appreciated it. I liked that he was there. And then Piggy, he's like running on the bus. It's good. It's, it's comedy. Classic comedy. <laughs> Classic <laughs> comedy. What? Pig rolling. Metallic pig rolling. <laughs> Which actually, I don't know if we have, we have so many things still mm-hmm. to talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, the design, like the actual like cr- creature design in this game, I thought was like, all over the fucking place. And, like, while I liked his design in, like, kind of a weird way, and, like, I love Kamashita's design. Yeah. Uh, as, like, Shadow Kamashita, like, where he's just, like, this big, like... Pink thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there are other things that are just, like, a lot of the personas feel kind of uninspired and probably comes from the fact that they're, like, 20 years old. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say, it's because they're from the Shin Megami Tensei and other Persona games and stuff. They're like legacy PS1 designs. Right. Yeah. It's like a Final Fantasy thing where they keep like they bring back the same monsters. So, yeah, which but is why we're still fighting Squ- skeletons in yeah. 2018. Square Enix puts a lot more effort into like updating those designs though. Yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, Persona 5 has literal dicks that you fight a yeah. lot. <laughs> you fight there are at least 3 enemies that are just dicks. Big dicks. Yeah. Like actual <laughs> think- anatomically correct I, I also think the incubus design is really funny or he just got like the giant dick right yeah good dude yeah that that, that incubus guy <laughs> i thought incubus incubi were supposed to be like sexy men but these are just like gargoyle bats <laughs> but in like the succubus is like a sexy lady right but yeah. incubus is like a weird cartoon goblin man <laughs> uh it's yeah, it's real. It's real weird. Were you unaware of how attractive women are to goblins? That's, <laughs> I like think that's a classic up, thing. Apparently. Yeah. 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 Take a look at the next you know Fabio actually is <laughs> goblin. Yeah, the whole time. Goblio. <laughs> There's three goblins stacked on top of each other. <laughs> Goblio, fuck me. You look really close. What you think is muscle definition is actually just like really tightly hugging goblins that are uh, okay. laughing upon one another. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> what other palaces do you want to talk about, Chad? You wanted to talk about Shido's? Yeah, I was yeah. I was hoping there would the, be other the things. The puzzles and the stealth mechanics were the big things I wanted to mention. Yeah, and that's and all we, fair. We already talked about like the safe rooms and stuff. And the visual design is good in all of them and varied. Mm-hmm. Shido's Palace actually has probably some of the best like scenery design mm-hmm. uh, because it's not like restricted. Mm-hmm. Spoilers. Sorry. It's fine. Uh, you're on a boat, and most of the passengers are just regular people, and so you end up with this sort of, like, semi... Like, this is where... This is what, like, I thought Persona was going to be before I played Persona, where it was, like, you as the main character going around through crowds of regular, normal people and occasionally engaging in some, like, RPG combat madness. Uh, yeah, it also feels the most like a real heist because of the real people. Mm-hmm. Well, that in the casino one too. Yeah, true. Yeah, casino one's great. Yeah, the, and I love the opening of the game. We didn't even mention that. Oh where, yeah, like, it drops you right. It um, it reminds me of like the opening of like a Sly Cooper game, mm-hmm. both yes. in its visuals, gameplay, and the fact that it's like a. <laughs> Uh, like a flashback. Yeah, flash it, it starts thing. in media res, and yeah. then was like, "No, nah, we don't want to do that." And then, <laughs> yeah. and, then and then when you replay it later, it's a great moment. Yeah. Yep. But unlike a Sly Cooper game, this has <laughs> like like sixteen other layers of game. Beneath <laughs> right. It. Yeah. 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 I was so surprised that it turned out that at the end of the game was not just catching up to the time oh yeah me too i was like wait you're kidding me yeah. there's literally yeah. more than yeah. this if we there's wanna, so much yeah. more if we want to keep ta- recording this podcast forever yeah uh, that was something i wanted to get into after we talked about the palaces is the fact that the game ends like five times right well the only thing i really wanted to tell you about because we we kind of discussed this a little bit discuss like talking about the other ones but Shida's palace is so long that I'm pretty sure that between the time that I entered the palace and when I beat the boss, what I thought was the final boss of the game but was off by 15, uh, <laughs> was like 
probably like 13 hours or like 10 hours. It was a shitload of time. Just like an entire other game <laughs> was just this, That's the it. last palace. That really wasn't my experience at all. <laughs> like it, it was just like about the same length as the others, I thought. Uh, it may be even a little bit shorter than the casino. Well, you have to also factor in the, in the fact that the boss has five phases and takes that, two hours I mean, on his own. The boss, yeah. <laughs> took forever but like the actual yeah. palace part i didn't think was that much longer yeah you'll be happy to know that a five phase final boss in this game not a spoiler kind of kind of assumed yeah, yeah, expected three yeah. to seven phases <laughs> roughly well the actual final boss only has two that's well he has like but he's got lots of other stuff going yeah on. he has like three sort of but you get like a break in the middle between the first and second uh-huh uh so yeah this game does end a lot yeah it's really good at ending mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah like the it actually ended up taking a lot of wind out of the sails of the game i thought that like the confrontation with like uh prime minister elect shido right uh felt like the climax of the game like you had like uh joker had like a personal relationship to him and like motivation for dealing with him mm -hmm. and the story all built to it and then after it's like you keep going, and then it's like, oh yeah, remember how like there was this thing with mementos? <laughs> Go back there uh, and do the RPG plot ending right. where you fight God. That's, I really felt like <laughs> oh damn, you fight God, yeah, damn it. you do. Uh, fight God. Another non spoiler. Yeah, it, it, it feel, like there are some good moments after that, but like it, it really just didn't. Yeah, there, it was a little bit flat. This is actually a really important point, and one that like I think we can just conclude on if we want to. Uh, there are some other things we could definitely talk about. Um, but, and I'm sad I buried this so far in the fucking episode. Uh, the, the problem with the end game, and the reason why the last like 20 hours of this game feel like kind of a slog, is because, it, it was, especially for me, a lot of the purpose of playing this game was not the palace part. It was sort of like just living this this life in persona and so what the last parts of this game do is they rob you of your agency or they don't but it feels like it because they no longer let you sort of like do the things you want to do outside of, yeah. of battle it kind of goes back to the way it was early on in the game where there's right. a lot more cut scenes and restrictions on your free time yeah and to the point where at the end they just go the, no more like you have no more free time you're just locked into the last like dungeon part and they could have done which it. goes on forever yeah, for like a million years it goes on for like 10 hours yeah <laughs> <laughs> it really would have benefited them i think to have made the last dungeon more open if they had let you sort of tackle it like piecemeal, and they could have yeah. even made it longer, which I'm sure they would have loved to do if they just gave you a different time limit, like an, uh, just another time limit that let you leave. Yeah. But I understand the, the desire to have some urgency, I guess. Right. But then they even... God, I hate it. Uh, yeah, like, so... they should have let you tackle the Mementos Palace like all the others. Right. and But, like, they even... Like, the sense of urgency has started because they give you, a, like, a false time limit at the beginning. So it's, like, days left a few at the top of the screen mm -hmm. uh, during that very brief period where you're outside of the, the dungeon before you go in. Mm -hmm. If they had just made that a regular time limit, like, actual days, then you could have just gone in because they then, when you get to the end reinstate a totally different unrelated sense of urgency yeah. they put in a completely other reason for you to be like anxious about wanting to finish it and so i, I don't know they it i feel like the ball was dropped and i don't know when it was dropped mm -hmm. it it could by the end of the game it, the ball could have been growing mold yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> now yeah, it got a bit sloppy at the end after yeah. uh shido ending was cool though yeah yeah like I said, good moments in there still, yeah. but it really, it, it lost a lot of its uh, momentum. Yeah. Is there anything we want to finish on, talk about? Do you want to do the quick hits? Oh, one thing, uh, I have a quick hit. Oh, perfect. Uh, <laughs> did it bother anyone else a lot that Morgana was a he and not a she? Yes. 
Okay, that, that bothered me the whole game. I never got used to it. Because it's a female voice actor and a girl's name. And a cat. And, okay, sure. That, not as much as the other two things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cats are like, I, uh, I Yeah, they're usually it, coded yeah. feminine. But yeah. female name and female voice actor. And it's always he. And it just never clicked with me. And a cute cat at that? Like, yeah. Not like a, like a masculine cat? Not like a buff? Well, men can be cute. Sh- Why cat? do we have to get... Because this is the same thing we did on Bayonetta. You we and your like... gender norms, JJ. <laughs> yeah, I think it's way more specific than that. He has, like, cat bias. Like, there's specific <laughs> cats that he finds more feminine or masculine than others. Yeah. Dude, Morgana, too regular. Too regular. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't bother me just because it evened out the uh, male and female ratio in the party. True. True. <laughs> and that's all I got for that. But, you know. I wonder what his, like, into car medium transition state looks like. Because he yeah, always, jumps. Do it off screen. He always yeah. jumps up and then falls back down as a car. The, there's an anime cut scene where he turns into the car. Oh, I've got that to look forward yeah, to. Yeah, so you'll see. Do it's his not... eyes like bulbous out and like form other <laughs> components? Yeah, that'd be great if they did the... <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna splice in the music here, but they play the persona like bad 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 song and like he's just like <laughs> it's just like, a total body horror. It just morphs oh. into a car. <laughs> we didn't really talk about mementos at all. That was actually one of my quick hits. Okay, because that's fine. I felt like mementos was a uh, it is like so unremarkable. I. I can imagine someone finding it enjoyable. That person wasn't me. Me neither. I actually, I feel like its strengths are kind of the opposite of what Bloodborne's Chalice Dungeon strengths are. Yeah. Like, I feel like Mementos is better integrated into the game. Correct. But, like, the Chalice Dungeon's content is better. Like, if you could merge the two, I think you'd have something good on your hands. Yeah, I think I can agree with you. Because that was, like, the biggest complaint with... I mean, and the Chalice Dungeon's content is not even that good. Yeah, but, but it's way be- better than Memento. Yeah, it's just because existing in, like, a combat-filled world of Bloodborne is a fun thing to do. Whereas, like, in Memento, it's like, yeah, I feel like I really want to go here, but then, like... Like, I was really intrigued about getting to the bottom. Right. It has, like, uh... Uh, th- there's definitely, like, a mystique to it. And as you get, like, the lower levels actually just look fucking sick yeah they uh, get more varied in their textures yeah and it's just cool overall but yeah it's going to mementos always felt like i waited till i built up like a nice chunk of requests to do it all at once yeah. so i didn't have to spend a whole lot of time in it i kind of wish that mementos wasn't gated in depth at all i i, I often use this as like a test case for uh, the overall quality of a lot of your systems. I can understand why they couldn't really do that in this game because, as I said many times before, this game relies very heavily on weakness exploiting and not very much on numerical damage. But I wish the systems of this game could have been designed in such a way that you could have had full access to the Mega Dungeon, but the systems would have naturally gated you instead of having to force the literal gates down. That definitely seems better. I think the... Uh, Savage Labyrinth, I think it's called, and Wind Waker works that way. Oh, yeah. Where you can access it when you're way too weak to get through it, but Zelda- you can still do it. <laughs> Zelda games naturally just very good at this for some reason, because like, think of like Breath of the Wild. You can just run in and fight Ganon immediately, Yeah. but you're just going to get fucking clobbered. Right. Yep. And that would have been a good way to, to gain mementos rather than physical game. But they also yeah. tie that into the narrative, so it's like they would have had to have come up with something. Classic something JRPG excuse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, the public hasn't thought about us enough, so you can't go to the next level yet. Sorry. Now, did anyone else find that little meter on the the loading screen like oddly motivational? Yeah, up to like the a seeing point, it slowly yeah. tick up and be mm-hmm. like, yeah, I'm making progress. Are the, are the phantom <laughs> thieves just? God damn right we are. Fuck yes, we are. <laughs> I'm kind of sad to say that I just assumed that it was lies. I assumed that nothing that I did could change that meter. We're not even 100% sure. I think that there's not really much you can do, but it definitely increases when you complete Mementos requests. Mm. Hmm. Or at least sometimes it does. Yeah. Okay. I think it. you have almost no effect on it, but either way, it still felt good to see it go up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last thing... 
the game should have ended with an eight person uh, all out attack and doesn't and so fuck me but whatever <laughs> yeah you're you couldn't be more right yeah that would have been dope it still ends in a dope way but just not as dope <laughs> suboptimal dopeness <laughs> Oh, uh, do we have final thoughts? I almost just went right oh, to the I ending. thought that's what you were going for. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I was, I was going for the ending. Uh, I guess I'll go first. Like, I really kind of loved this game. Mm-hmm. Uh, more than I expected. Like, from what I knew about it, I, I was pretty sure I'd like it. But I liked it. I ended up liking it more than I expected to. And I think it's missing, like, maybe, like, a... It was narrative solid, but I think maybe if it had, like, a slightly better narrative... Or some other kind of other hook or something. This could be one of my favorite games. Like I, I love so much of like the style and the like atmosphere, the characters, the how it, the whole package. And uh, I don't. Know. And I also think like if this game had been like promoted more, that it could be like go down as, like, an all-time classic. Like, I think this really could have had a lot of mainstream appeal. Right. I feel like it's weird to me that, like, it is a PlayStation exclusive, and PlayStation exclusives, like, recently have gotten these huge followings. Like, people are, like, really rallying behind games like God of War or uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Uh, Horizon Zero Dark. <laughs> yeah, 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 Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Well, their whole E3 thing this past year was those big four right, yeah. games. Like, what was it? The Last of Us yeah, the last... and the other three you just mentioned. Right. So, that might... Tagging tag shit on uh, PlayStation. Ooh. They're coming yeah. for us. So that the Xboxers. Be... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Xbox police. Um, but that might be a little bit manufactured by Sony themselves, but... Mm. Yeah, who who really knows? But it's weird because like I feel like this game probably because it is a set exclusive. They should show some pride for this game, yeah. which is more engaging than like, I mean, you really liked Horizon Zero Dawn. I didn't really like it. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, I think it's overrated, honestly. Yeah, I think we're all kind of lukewarm on. But we I are, did finish yeah. it. Yeah, so, so I, I did like it. I did play like fifteen minutes of it. <laughs> uh, Oh, yeah, so my final thoughts on it are basically kind of the same, except for I didn't engage with the RPG parts of it, which makes it really hard to put it among my favorites. But, like, as far as JRPGs go, this is up there with, you know, like, it's just shy of, like, Earthbound and Chrono Trigger, which only really uh, surpass it because of, like, they didn't take a year of my life to finish. (laughs) Uh, And... Other than that, like, you could probably mirror everything that you just said, and I would agree with it, uh, except I would like to call out that uh, I never spoke about it at all, pretty much on the podcast, but uh, Ryuji is a really great character, <laughs> and I think should be in every video game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's why you've got that shirt. It is. Yeah, I just love... Ryuji's so good. Like, he's he's a really amusing, well-written yeah. character, and his voice actor's really good. Yeah. Also, voice acting the game, good overall. We didn't yeah. mention it. Matt yeah. Mercer plays Yusuke, which is yep. like the fucking Smash Brothers announcer plays the main character. Like, <laughs> it's really weird. Yeah, yeah, the voice acting was surprisingly good. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I also liked all the characters except for Haru, who was my least favorite anime trope, which is reserved shy girl. Right. The, From a rich family. Yeah, yeah that, she, the exact character that uh, Mikuru is a parody of. Mm. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, nice. I don't like that kind of character. But anyway. I don't think my overall opinion, obviously not fully formed, because I do intend to complete this game over the next two to three years. <laughs> uh, but I resent this game in the strangest way. It really it's it's kind of odd and it it sh- i so often while playing this game kept being reminded how much i liked Catherine moore and that's such, such a, a dumb comparison right like uh, they're from the same publisher but their goals are entirely different they're just sharing an engine and an art style because they share an audience to a great degree but i while playing this game i loved a lot of the same things that we've described i loved the art direction i love the sense of like genuine style that's going into everything that you went through but i didn't find what you were doing 
narratively as interesting. I didn't find what your the characters specifically that interesting overall. Like my interest meter maxed out at like sexy single doctor or single <laughs> punk rock doctor. That's it. Yeah, yeah. At, at about it, her. It, and you don't have to say that she's sexy. We yeah, all know. I was nice. Thank you. <laughs> it's assumed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like and and also even there it was not that high. It was just and to say that the thing that I latched onto highest was one of the most disconnective er- narrative elements of the game does not speak highly with it because. I liked how this game looked, and I liked the confidence that this game brought to the table, but nothing that it did, whether mechanically or narratively, really hooked me to any degree as interesting as it looked. So I kept being drawn in by the promise of the visuals and getting there and kind of just feeling like, I wish this didn't take too much time. And not even in a, I'm going to complete this for the podcast way. Because I've been playing this since like September or something stupid. Yeah. Like this has been a major part of my life. But I kept coming back to it and like opening another text message chat and just skipping through the text messages. Because I know like there's nothing here that I feel like is going to be new information in this chat. I kept going through the combat feeling like after the initial testing phase, when I meet each creature newly for the first time, there wasn't anything more for me to learn or do than what I was going through. And I just felt like exploiting weaknesses that I already knew how to do. But it was just pretty enough, just aesthetically great enough. And the music was so driving behind everything that I do that it was able to get me into that kind of hypnotic state. And I kind of resent that the game didn't hook me so strongly that it was a kind of hypnotism that I can look back on proudly instead of like a strange thing that sucked up an incredibly large amount of my life. Yeah. I found that like over and over again, I would be like, okay, I need to, I'm going to quit playing. And then I would like keep playing, get to the room and then just go to sleep and be like, fuck. (laughs) Like I just started the next day (laughs) and I was like, well, I guess I'll just do the next day too. (laughs) I did that so many times. Yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> it's important because I, I agree with you and then came off more positively. Yeah. Uh, like, I, because I think that everything you said is correct because if you look at the things that we praised about this, we talked about the aesthetic value, we talked about uh, the music of the game, we talked about the designs, we talked about the variance of the, the areas and the yeah. way that everything was structured, but, like, this is a kitchen sink game. Yeah. This is everything is in it, and there's enough there that you're going to enjoy that you will keep coming back even if the overall experience is lacking. I think that's almost kind of the thesis that we had. Oh, you're totally right. This is, to JRPGs, what the Ubisoft open world adventure game is to Western games. That's actually a pretty good, except the, the this isn't tired and boring. <laughs> right, right. This has energy behind it and right. was made by people who clearly care a lot and have a distinct, at least visual style that they wanted to get across. It's just at some level, I feel like this would be a better TV show. As I do, and it is a TV show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do hope that like, or I hope not in 10 years, we end up with, like, oh, that's a Persona game. Like, it's going to take, like, uh, 100 hours every time and be okay. I really don't think that'll happen. Like, I think they've set the bar way too high. <laughs> I mean, this was, like, like I said earlier, like, a seven-year development cycle. Oh, yeah. Like, like, it's just, the production value is, like, off the charts. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think anyone's going to touch it. It's, yeah. Who you can know, afford to? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, Atlas is not even, like, that big of a studio. They, I'm amazed they They've they gained able... a lot of traction. Oh, for sure. Years. Like, it's because of the downfall of Square. I think they've really, nudge, like, nuzzled their way in there. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. That's a weird note to end on. Uh, <laughs> nuzzled their way in there? No, they, really, really, they really nuzzled their way in there. <laughs> Why are you threatened by nuzzling? <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't know. It's fine. Those are our final thoughts. But Thank you for listening to NoClip this week. What are we talking about next time? Next time, we're going to talk about Super Smash Brothers. Ultimate. Uh-oh. Oh, sorry. I can do it again. <laughs> I can do it again. Nope. Nope. Uh, Please have the music sing at like exactly the time. <laughs> yeah, well, that'd be good. Yeah, th- that's worth the infringement takedown that we'll get. No, no, <laughs> just, just play the brawl thing. It's <laughs> the best one. It is a good one. Uh, <laughs> which is not, at, at the time of recording, 
is going to be out in three hours and two minutes. But that's what we're doing. I actually have nothing to say. I think everyone knows what fucking Smash Brothers is. <laughs> you yes. don't need us to hype you on this. Come on. <laughs> uh, until that time, you can get a hold of us. All of our contact information, email, Twitter, our YouTube, all that shit is on our website at noclippodcast.com or on splittershot.pro. Uh, check out. We've got lots of episodes at this point. This is what, episode like 72? Oh, God, I don't know. This is episode lots uh, we're getting there, so uh, <laughs> I have no idea. We're gonna yeah. die soon, probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, yeah. So check out all the other shit that you might be interested. If this is the first time that you're listening to us, uh, leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. It really helps, or you know, it helps. It helps more than not doing it does. <laughs> uh, so think about that, guys. Uh, <laughs> You can build your confidant relationship <laughs> with the members of the No Clip podcast by pressing that subscribe yeah, I was button. trying to figure out a way to make a last subscribe joke. <laughs> <laughs> I think just saying yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Let the No Clip uh, podcast be your last subscribe. There you go. Yeah, nailed it. All right. <laughs> Swish. <laughs> Let's go wait in a chair for three hours. All that right. swish was the equivalent of like walking up to an empty basketball hoop and like pulling the basketball up and like kind of like angling it like three times and then throwing it. No, and it's then it's it like <laughs> throwing it into like a child's basketball. Hoop. <laughs> walking up to a full size basketball hoop in someone's yard, lowering right. the hoop, yes. and then <laughs> pulling swish. swish. <laughs>
Yeah, because they play, they played it at the Game Awards. Yeah, can you imagine that? You're sitting in the audience, and then like the the calling card comes up on the screen, right? right yeah. And it's fucking Smash Brothers. <laughs> like, now this is this is entirely unbelievable. And I just wanted to jump back in to say that we didn't plan this. <laughs> no, not at all. How long have we been playing for Sunday? You said like since, since yeah, September. Yeah, we we all yes. started it in September. Yeah, yeah. So nobody was like. <laughs> Uh, you know, I bet they're going to release Joker to Smash Brothers. <laughs> no insider trading going on at the Noclip offices. <laughs> yeah. Do we, oh, wait, we should... Never mind, scrap all this. The new narrative, we leaked Joker <laughs> by announcing the Persona <laughs> we, podcast. We changed Sakurai's heart. We, yeah, and we got him to put Joker in the game. <laughs> Oh, oh Jesus Christ! Good God! All right. What are the Dude. other content packs gonna be? Uh, <laughs> Kaede and Suichi for Smash. <laughs> That's a duo. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, like li- that literally blows the doors wide open. Steve from Harvest. Yeah, dude. Steve for Smash. <laughs> Steve for Smash. Boss and Grab cheese robot. <laughs> Darth Vader. Darth Vader. <laughs> God, that fuck. weird wizard guy that's my PlayStation icon. <laughs> oh, God. It's, that's too specific to us, Chad. You can't I, I'm make sorry. Those jokes on the, on the, the wizard from Trine for Smash. <laughs> Amadeus for yeah, Smash. Amadeus. <laughs> well, the, the Trine trio as like a, yeah, as, as yeah. a thing it's could a be Pokemon. Like a Pokemon yeah, trainer yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for <laughs> indulging this like moment of weird. Uh, serendipity with us. It checks out in three yeah, like, weeks from time. I don't have face. anyone else I can even tell about this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I want to tell someone. Right. And they're going to be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Who? <laughs> from Batman? What? <laughs> <laughs> I do <laughs> uh. well, I don't know anyone. I don't know any other weebs yeah. that have played this game. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, get good talk, guys. Yeah, we're gonna go play Smash Brothers in twelve minutes, like we planned to initially. Yeah, yeah, we were playing the Italian job <laughs> on PS One when we discovered this. You like, can't tell our fans this. You can't say that, like, oh man, we know so much about games. Really key. We never, we never claimed to know. <laughs> So much about games. But they're gonna think the Italian job for the t- for the PS1 is like a diamond in the rough now. It's gonna it's, oh, okay. Claire uh, point of clarification. <laughs> it ain't. Uh, spend lots of money on a new copy of the Italian job for PlayStation One. <laughs> think of the amount of like hypothetical price spikes we could cause. Uh, I am thinking of them. None. <laughs> It's, it's supply and demand, Chad. Uh-huh. If four more people want to buy the Italian job... That's like a one million percent right. increase. Exactly. There's like two copies left in the world outside of the one that God. you own. I want to see his like his poster. You know how oh, like they yeah. make posters for all the characters? I wouldn't be surprised if they like actually got someone at Atlas, like whoever like the art director was, right. to do a poster. It'll be sick. Well, yeah. Bye!